This is a show about breasts and the people who have them. From bras and sexuality to health and everyday life, this is the very breast podcast ever. Hi, breasties. Welcome to the very first itty bitty episode of the very breast podcast ever. In this episode, we sat down with Miami-based influencer, blogger, writer, mom, and fellow breast haver, Maria Tetamanti. With more than 32,000 followers on Instagram and a huge fan base for her blog, The Wordy Girl, Maria creates daily content centered around fashion, lifestyle, personal development, and travel, as well as everyday musings on happenings in pop culture and her own life and family. We chatted with her over Zoom about her experience as an influencer and how it related back to our favorite topic, breasts. Maria shared her breast experience with us and gave us some new ways to think about nipple censorship. (laughs) Watching Maria's stories has become one of my morning routines. Whether she's teaching us how to make an easy weeknight dinner as the Greek Gwyneth Paltrow, teasing her kids about knowing nothing about the Kardashians, or showcasing her husband husbanding to the soundtrack of Genuine's Pony, Watching her content never fails to put me in a good mood. Honestly, I just want to take a minute to say, if you don't follow her already, get your butt, sorry, your boobs, on Instagram right now and follow Maria Tetamanti because we all need a little fun and happiness in our lives these days. Do it while this bouncy intro music plays. I'll wait. show Maria. Thank you so much for having me. It's my first time, my first rodeo. Oh, we're really excited to have you and we're excited to talk to you. Um, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Tell us a little about yourself. Sure. I'm um, Maria Tetamanti. I am a Miami-based journalist, blogger, influencer, social media ninja, mom, and wife, and dog mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> what social media platform do you use the most, would you say? Instagram and it's a problem and I'm trying to wean myself off it a little more every day. When did you start your Instagram account? Oh my God. I really, you know, I don't know the year to be honest with you, but, um, it's pretty shocking that I'm a 44 year old mom and I have a pretty big following and like a lot of young people follow me, which I think is really funny. I, I, I keep to a very steady recipe of working out in the morning. Um, cooking, picking up the kids, ragging on my husband, ragging on my dog, ragging on my <laughs> everyone. I just trying to make find humor in all the little small things in life. So you have, I think, more than 32,000 followers at this point. And, and by like, you know, unofficial definitions, you're an influencer, you know? So w- what does the word influencer mean to you? And, and would you consider yourself one? Um, I do. I hate the word influencer, to be honest, because when you think influencer, you think like basic bitch and you think um, (laughs) the Gucci bell and the scarf around the neck and, um, you know, all the things and Starbucks coffee in her hand. Um, But I do find I'm an influencer, clearly, because I get tons of boxes every day of free products. And um, that's amazing. And um, I'm basically a way to advertise your product. You know, if I love your product, I'm going to feature it on my Instagram. I'm going to feature it on my blog. And that's kind of where I'm at. That's definitely influencing, right? Yeah, I think so. And and you have a lot of people, I think, that are pretty loyal to your posts every day. I know I watch your story every day. Thank you. Um, in addition, so you mostly post, I think, about like travel and fashion. That's kind of your brand, right? Yeah, I'd say that travel, fashion, and, you know, beauty is a big market for most, for all influencers, you know, there's, they have big marketing budgets. And I'd say that during the pandemic, people really went to skincare and staying home and doing face masks and doing their own manis and petties. So that's definitely blown up in the past, past year. But you also post some really funny and engaging stuff about your family and and your life. Um, Has having your life on display for your followers changed the way you live it? I've always been very authentic. And that's what people always tell me is that you always keep it so real. You know, your husband's so grumpy and you show him always grumpy and your kids are funny and you show them funny, but you also show that they make a mess. So Um, no, I've, I've never like staged things per se. I always keep it real. I don't really believe in like the perfect life and Instagram life. I kind of meld the two. 
It's funny. I always tell people that the um, static posts are like my, where you go and see the the evergreen content. It, it's kind of like Instagram life and it's perfect and it's curated. And I use Facetune sometimes, never on my body, but I will like, if a brand says, take the logo out of your purse, I'll Facetune the logo out, whatever. Um, and then in stories, I, for the most part, go bare face, but there are some days where, girl, I just need that smoky <laughs> eye filter. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do find it interesting that women's nipples are censored or I have a friend who had breast cancer and she's very vocal about it. You know, she's like, this is my art. She's always, she always shows her, she both her breasts were taken, you know, she gets censored for that. And she's like, I don't even have a nipple and she'll sometimes get in trouble for it. But it's. It's, it's, it's interesting to me that men can show it and women can't mm-hmm. show it. But at the same time, children are on this platform. So we have to be weary. Yeah. So when we were doing research for this episode, one of the things that Instagram says is that they have to um, produce images that are suitable to a really diverse, huge audience. Mm-hmm. But one thing that really surprised me is that it's not just nipples, female nipples that are um, censored. It's also one of their criteria is breast squeezing really so you can't go like this no and and so there was one instagrammer in particular who got in trouble because um and she actually helped change the rules on nudity and instagram because she's a plus size model and she posted a nude photo of herself but she was covering her breasts but because her breasts were large it actually looked like she was squeezing her breasts so it got flagged and it got taken down i feel like i see a lot of squeeze breasts on instagram still yeah Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) but I didn't know that was a criteria. Interesting. So do you think that nipple censorship is something we should all care about? I mean, it's interesting. I think that I'm Greek. When we go to the beach, everyone is topless. No one really cares. Everyone's taking photos. Everyone's living their best lives. I've been raised to be okay with freeing the nipple. Um, I, I I don't see what the big deal is in showing a nipple. I don't think, I don't see with Janet Jackson and the Super Bowl. I didn't even find that gauche to be honest with. So <laughs> I'm very liberal when it comes to the nipple. Picture it. It's 2004, Super Bowl 38, the halftime show. I was a freshman in high school, studded belts, low rise jeans, reading my friends' live journals. It was long before Instagram, before streaming, before the iPhone. The idea that the goofy, rich host of that new reality show could one day become president was not even a distant dream in our minds. I'm trying to say it was a long time ago, okay? On live TV, Justin Timberlake took to the stage, which was adorned with an enormous, flesh-colored balloon display of his own name above him, and sang his new single, Rock Your Body, with Janet Jackson. Janet was wearing a beautiful leather and red lace ensemble, and marched around the stage, followed by Justin Timberlake, clad in an unimpressive college boy uniform of baggy khakis, a green thermal, and a jacket that was too big on him. As they marched around the stage to the beat of the song, when Justin hit the last line, I'ma have you naked by the end of this song, he deliberately ripped the right cup of Janet's bustier clear off her breast, exposing her breast to the public for about a half second. The incident shocked viewers across the country, even though Janet's nipple was covered with an elaborate nipple shield. She immediately covered her breast and looked at Justin with what I would describe as shock. When I first saw this happen with my own eyes, I did not for one second believe it was an accident, and I would guess that anyone else watching didn't feel that way either. Recently, even the stylist involved in the performance has alleged that it wasn't. According to him, it was Justin's idea, and the original plan was actually to reveal her ass, but obviously the plan changed. Nevertheless, Janet Jackson was punished by the media and the public for what happened. Viacom blacklisted her singles from their networks. That included CBS, MTV, and multiple radio stations. Her invitation to the Grammys was withdrawn. A statue of Mickey Mouse in Disney World honoring Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation was taken down. CBS and MTV both apologized after the event, calling it a, quote, wardrobe malfunction, and saying they had no knowledge of what was going to happen during the performance. What kind of backlash did Justin receive? After all, he's the one who ripped the cup off her breast. Not a whole lot. People Magazine called him the, quote, Teflon Man that year because for the most part, he was only mentioned in passing in coverage of the event. He himself said he only received about 10% of the blame. In the years since then, the general view on this topic has shifted to acknowledge Justin's responsibility in it. 
Even Justin took to Instagram recently to apologize to Janet and to his ex, Britney Spears, saying, quote, I can do better and I will do better. I certainly hope so, Justin. We spoke more to Maria about the famous incident. I was totally fine with it. Um, I know it was national television. I know a lot of their child viewers. I wasn't okay with the way Justin Timberlake handled the situation. He sold her out, right? He He really did. And even I think I was 12 or 13 when it happened. And I remember seeing it and it like, he so clearly rips it off her bra. There's no question about it. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like it it malfunctioned. He literally just ripped it off her bra. It was not a malfunction. I mean, clearly her costume had a cutout. They were trying to push the envelope. Um, I think the way he handled it was just completely wrong. Um, he apologized for it recently, though. Do you? Uh, yeah, you he kind of had to. No, I don't accept. He's a dollar <laughs> short, and a, 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 no, no. Man, mm-hmm. Many, many years late. <laughs> yes, too late. Too late. I'm so naive. I also thought. I mean, well, not naive, but like when that happened, I just was like, "Oh, that was intentional." Like I didn't. And then no, because if you're in fashion, you knew that that costume was made with the cutout on the nipple and the velcro, and there's so many things that go behind design right Nadia he also yeah. had very yeah. like, <laughs> awesome looking piercing on her yes <laughs> no I mean come on <laughs> that was yeah I don't know what I mean yeah it, it was national television and there are laws to that so what they did in that regard was illegal no do you think it would have had the same effect if it happened today mm-hmm. oh I think the wokesters would come for them absolutely I think what would be different nowadays, though, is there would be a lot more people standing up for Janet. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Because at the time, she really took the brunt of it. She took all of the heat. Absolutely. He did not man up at all. No. No balls. Well, so you're you live in Miami, right? Oh, yeah. So what's the culture and attitude in Miami when it comes to female nipples? Do you think it's different from other parts of the country you've traveled to? Look, Miami is literally the sexiest city in the planet. Um, I always tell people if my marriage can survive Miami, it can survive anywhere. <laughs> it, people walk around half naked at all hours of the day. If you go to the mall on a Saturday, you will see a woman in a bikini walking around in heels. Um, you'll see women walking around with like a see-through cover up with, you know, the pasties on their nipples. We are definitely a more laissez-faire sartorial city. Um, do you feel like you, you kind of live by that laissez-faire personally? I'm big on, I have little bees, I believe. So I'm okay with being braless at all times. I'm a big fan of nipple, the silicone nipple guards. Oh yeah. I don't like, I don't like showing my um, headlights. That's fair. That's fair. Um, Do you ever censor yourself when you post something? And if so, in what way? Yeah, I won't. I'm not comfortable with showing headlights. So because I'm braless a lot. Um, So I will like I I, I don't know. I find them like, I don't know. Headlights are kind (laughs) of sexy, right? They're very personal. Yeah, 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 exactly. (laughs) So I feel like headlights are a no for me. Um, But I'm totally comfortable wearing a bathing suit or a bikini on Instagram. I'm fine with it. So one thing I think is uh, interesting is like the creative ways that a lot of influencers have found to, to hide their nipples on Instagram. So if you did ever find yourself having to censor a picture of your nipples, are you like a smiley face person? Would you blur them out or like, no girl (laughs) face, face tune has the patch. It has a patch option. Are you aware of it? No. Yeah. So I, okay. So I actually had to do it for a photo. So you literally can patch on face too. And you can like cut a piece of the fabric from your skirt and move it up to your nipple. Oh, huh. Mm-hmm. That's creative. Mm-hmm. It's funny. My friend over the weekend, she posted a dot and I wanted to call her. I was like, girl, what do you like? No, like, no, <laughs> like that looks so bad. Like I wanted to tell her, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to stay in my lane on this one. It probably looks a lot more natural. Like just putting a piece of fabric over it. Correct. Yeah. It doesn't look and- edited. Another thing that I read about was there is an artist who actually developed a male nipple pasty. So it's an image of a man's nipple that you can put as a woman, you can put on your own nipple and it doesn't get flagged because it's not a female nipple. (laughs) Oh, that is crazy. That is crazy. (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> have you yourself ever changed your mind about posting something due to feeling like it might get taken down? Um, no, I've never been that, um, no, I've never been that sexy that they've ever taken it down. I think I have, I'll send you my biggest thirst prop. It was like on the beach of Bahama and it's like of my ass. And I even said it, I was like posting a thirst trap. Um, I was very open about it, but the thirst traps get followers guys. I actually, I remember that post. It was like a, a Sandy butt, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. It was a good post. exactly. Like, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so is that still up or, or did you take that down? It's still up. Yeah. Uh, it's totally up. Yeah. That's a great picture. Um, so earlier you mentioned, you know, there are kids who, who, um, look at Instagram and that's as a mom, that's probably really important to you as far as, um, censoring images you don't want them to see right exactly so I I always have to think like I even had a medical marijuana client for a while and I had to be cognizant of my kids like what am I comfortable with posting and I, I told the brand you know I'm only going to do edibles and um, lozenges or drops I'm like I'm not going to put a blunt on you know yeah my Instagram <laughs> <laughs> you know so you have to be cognizant of you know your brand per se. Um, so in what instances in that case, would you feel like it's appropriate to post a picture of a female nipple? I don't know. There's a fine line between, I mean, look, I'm okay with anyone posting a nipple, whether it's like a Venus de Milo statue, whether it's a woman topless on the beaches of Greece, whether it's a, a girl trying to, you know, find a man, a sugar daddy. I don't, I don't really <laughs> care. I have a really laissez-faire attitude about it. Um, how do you manage making sure your kids don't see things that you don't want them to see? Um, it's funny. Ki my kids are not, I mean, it's probably, they're in a scarier space. They're in Snapchat. They're more on Snapchat, which is very scary because that, they don't even text anymore. I don't know if you're aware of this. Kids, teenagers, they use Snapchat. That's how they communicate because it erases. Mm -hmm. I, I do go through their phones. Like that's the only way I can gauge what's going on. I'm a creep. I creep like the FBI. I'm like the CIA. <laughs> well, I think uh, if it's mom, it's okay though. A hundred percent. But as, as an adult, I can say that your kids probably don't feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> so the only way I do is that I just go through their phones and make sure everything's kosher. So um, in an imaginary world where social media is not censoring female nipples, do you think that we could see any positive outcomes from that? I'm okay with it. You know, if you're confident enough and feel good enough about yourself to do it, why not? But actually, I have a feeling more people would be on OnlyFans so. though. <laughs> but since, since you brought up OnlyFans, actually that takes it in a direction I didn't even think of where the female mm -hmm. nipple is kind of like something precious that, that shouldn't just be out there, right? Like that's, that's kind of a, a cool way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Or oh, uh, at least for a lot of women, they monetize the nipple. If you think about it, mm -hmm. you know, I have a lot of influencer friends that they make a lot of money showing the nipple, freeing the nipple. So who knows? Do you have time just for a few like rapid fire questions? Of course. All right. What do you call your breasts? Do you have oh my God. Words? My husband has called me sweet tits our entire lives. So believe it or not, they're called their sweet tits. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> that sounds like a candy. <laughs> yeah. So sweet tits. Yeah. Um, or what's I, your... I call them the girls, like the girls are out. I'm going to show the girls, the girls. What's your least favorite word for boobs, for breasts? It's pro I mean, I I'm sure for most people it's tits, but, um, oh, let's think. Pro probably tits. How horrible is that? <laughs> I'm calling my boobs the worst thing ever tits you know it's funny you said that because we've asked a couple people that question and I think I'm the only person who said tits was one of my favorite words for breasts <laughs> <laughs> I mean tie you know what I don't like tatas I think it's lame sweet free the tatas yeah tatas are, is kind of lame bad ones out there that I only discovered from looking at the wikipedia there's a wikipedia dish what are they terms and there's like oh. I mean there's the obvious like jugs and stuff like that but there's like Let's see, we have balloons, baps, that's British, which is also a word for hamburger bun. Baps, okay. Yeah. Bazongas. Oh Bazongas, yeah. <laughs> um, bosoms. That's Breasticles. 
Oh gosh. I'm not crazy about breasticles. I think it's, I think it's a little I'm, uh, condescending. <laughs> yeah. It's the visual too. I think of testicles. No, no bueno. Chichis. That's cute. Yeah. That's like fun. Dirty yeah. pillows. Ding dongs. Mm. Oh, slapjacks. I have flapjacks, right? But that's bad. That's not on the list, but we should add that. Flapjacks. Yeah, flapjacks. Yeah. <laughs> so um, gross. Love pillows. I like that. Melons. Oh, I like imagine those women's on botched on Bravo TV. So there's there's titties with two T's or there's titties with two D's. Oh, D's. Oh, like double D's. <laughs> I think double entendre. <laughs> um, three penny bits. Never heard of that one. Top bollocks. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> that sounds British. Um, udders. Oh. <laughs> that, um, is that a technical term? <laughs> like, it says in parentheses. That's what cows have slang slash impolite. Yeah, it is impolite. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. So what is your favorite thing or something interesting about your own breasts? I have, I have, I actually have really thought I've had very good breasts and I'll tell you why. Like they're perky, they're little bees. They look great. Like I don't have to wear a bra all the time. Um, so I have to say that the biggest perk of my boobs are I don't have to wear a bra all the time. And that was like the, the beauty of the pandemic, right? We didn't have to yeah. wear a bra all the time, but I've always been that girl. It didn't take a pandemic for me to realize that not wearing a bra is a gift. Well, actually, it, for me, it took a pandemic because I'm a, I was an underwire person. I refused to wear anything but an underwire. And then during the pandemic, I was just like, fuck it. Like, I don't, I don't need to be uncomfortable. <laughs> right. And it, isn't it a wonderful life? It's freeing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely amazing. I'm, not I'm wearing not, no bra. I'm not brave enough to go bra less yet, but I'm definitely, I'm definitely a soft bra person though. But what about inside your home? Oh, inside my home, I take them off as soon as I get in the door. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't go out in public either braless right now. But um, actually, that's not true. I'll, I'll just wear a silicone nipple guard. I've lived um, my whole life, like my whole adult life, feeling like I need at least seven hours of free balling. So I, I can't okay. I can't spend the entire day in a bra. <laughs> Got it. Because there's people that sleep in a bra. Yeah, I've never understood that. I just can't do it. I think it, I don't know if it was Heidi Klum or another supermodel said that the reason why her boobs are so good is because she literally sleeps in a bra. What do you think is the hardest part of having breasts? I, I, exercising, to be honest, you know, you need support. So um, that's definitely that. And um, I just say, oh, yeah, the comfort, the discomfort you feel when, when running and things like that. Who bought you your first bra? probably my mom and it was probably Victoria's Secret ratchet <laughs> I think mine was Victoria's Secret too yeah <laughs> see I'm sorry you guys are lucky because I got like a Sears bra <laughs> like my first bra was definitely like JC Penny or Sears so oh my god where'd you grow up where were you at Vermont. where are you at from? it was Vermont. Vermont okay and it was like yeah. my cousin's grandmother who bought it for me but I really I was like a training bra that she bought for me and I think I somehow like manipulated her into getting it for me so got it I totally skipped the training bra phase I my boobs grew in really fast I was a b cup when I was 12 and then about four or five months later I grew I was up to a d already right Oof. yeah so I I had to go straight for the serious bras <laughs> I believe I'm a 34, 34C. I always thought I was a B. I see, I still say I'm a B, but no, the C helps, you know, spread out a little better. Yeah, actually that's, that's true. And if you, um, if you get a chance to listen to our episode about bra size, it's very, very likely that you are both a B and a C. Right, like, exactly. Yeah, right, right. There, there are sizes that relate to each other. So it just depends on what bra you're happy in. Exactly. Um, so what type of bra, if any, are you wearing now and why? I wear a lot, um, Calvin Klein, Wakol, Wakol and, um, yummy. I wear the yummy a lot. The it's, it's the seamless one with on zero underwire when I just went like schlepping around, you know, running errands. Um, it's like a t-shirt bra or I'll wear Calvin Klein or Wakol cause they're, they're super comfortable, but I do have wear underwire. Is that bad? 
No, of course not. What, whatever okay. makes your breasts happy is, is what I think you should yeah. wear. <laughs> got it. And I, I go again, we're in Miami and everyone shows cleavage like it's their job. So <laughs> it is what um, it is. What do you do to treat your breasts? Any products or practices, self-care? Uh, the only self-care I'd say for my, specifically for my breasts are, I do my yearly mammogram always. I'm very, I was even religious about that during the pandemic. Um, I do, um, always like moisturize this area, the decolletage. I don't know if I said that right. Um, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I don't do breast exams though. I, I probably should do those more. Yeah. I mean, my, uh, my sister had breast cancer when she was really young and I have, mm -hmm. I have a lot of breast cancer in my family. So that's, that's one thing that I think every woman should do. And it, it's like the worst part of the month for me where like, I have to gear myself up. I'm like, okay, we're going to do it. Yeah. We're going to do it now. Like, yeah, but it's, it's the best way to catch it. Okay. Thank you, Maria. I'm really bad at it. I sometimes am guilty of not doing it until my OBGYN, the like my annual. Yeah. I'm not annual. I'm same. Damn. It's kind of like flossing, right? Like if the dentist asks you, have you been flossing? Like you're just, you, no, I waited till you did it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right, Maria. So I think that's it. Unless there's anything else you want to talk about or add any other thoughts? No, about... I w thank you so much. Thanks so Bye, much for girl. joining us, Maria. Of course. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Before I leave you this episode, I want to mention that breast exams are probably one of the best things you can do for your breasts. We'll be doing some future episodes about breast cancer, but in the meantime, remember this. 40% of all diagnosed breast cancers are detected by women who feel a lump. Our breasts change shape and feel different during different parts of our cycle, so it's recommended you do your self-exam once a month about a week after your period ends. Not only does doing it monthly help you detect lumps, it helps you get used to how your breasts feel so you can alert your doctor to any changes in your breast tissue. Go to www.nationalbreastcancer.org for step-by-step -step instructions on how to give yourself a breast exam. We'll link it in our show notes. Oh, and when it comes to flossing, did you know that teeth are the only part of your body that can't heal itself? Flossing before you brush your teeth can help your toothbrush function better, remove plaque, reduce bad breath, and most importantly, help prevent cavities and tooth loss. There's even some studies that say flossing can contribute to heart health, reduce the chance of preterm birth during pregnancy, and help prevent dementia. Take care of your teeth, breasties. So feel those boobies once every month. I do it in the shower while I'm conditioning my hair. And while you're at it, put some floss next to your shampoo in the shower and use that time to floss your teeth every day too. The Very Breast Podcast Ever was written, produced, and recorded by Nadia Figueroa and Alyssa McHugh. Cover art by Alyssa McHugh. Opening music by Margaret Tran. Check her out on Spotify. For episode transcripts and sources, please visit our website at theverybreastpodcastever.com. Do you have questions? Corrections? Do you want to tell us your breast story? Get in touch with us on Instagram at theverybreastpod or email us at theverybreastpodcastever at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Now go out and make today the breast day ever. <laughs>